Hi there, this is David Dyer, and today we're going to be talking about a Bible verse, which is a well-known verse, but has been the basis for many, many Christians, millions of Christians, maybe even billions of Christians, deceiving themselves. We have been discussing in our series of videos how important it is to be transformed to be changed by God, to become something different than we are, to be liberated from sin, and to be freed from our own human nature by the power of Jesus and the work of his cross in our lives. However, some people think, that's silly. I don't need to worry about any of that. When Jesus comes, I am going to be changed instantly in an instant, in the twinkling of an eye. And so they think, why bother to seek God to be changed now? What difference does it make? Everything's already forgiven. God doesn't see my sin now. And when he comes, he's going to tap me on the head with a magic wand. Presto, changeo, abracadabra and I'm going to be instantly holy. Why in the world worry about that today? If tomorrow it is all going to be taken care of quickly, easily, without any cost or suffering to me. Many, many people think that in their hearts or even openly. I've heard it taught that Paul was a fool. He didn't need to suffer. He didn't need to deny himself. He didn't need to die daily. He just needed to believe, which by which they mean adjust his mind to thinking everything's good with God and wait for that magic day when it will all be changed in the twinkling of an eye. Paul was really wrong. Well, it's funny, but he's the one who wrote that verse, which we're now going to read together. This is 1 Corinthians 15, starting with verse 51. Look, I will tell you a secret. We will not all sleep, means to die here, but we will all be changed in an instant, in the blink of an eye, at the sounding of the final trumpet. For that trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised incorruptible, and we will be changed together with them. Okay. So here's the magic moment. Here's the time when what we are, our sinful, selfish, egotistical nature, is suddenly changed into the image of Jesus. Well, no, it isn't, and it will not be. This verse is not talking about the salvation of the soul. It is talking about the transformation or the transfiguration or the glorification of our body. Now, if you read the context of this verse, Paul is answering a question that some people were asking. Let me read that question. This is 1 Corinthians 15, 35. But some will ask, how are the dead raised and what kind of body will they have? And then Paul goes on for quite a few verses, talking about the flesh of birds, the flesh of fish, the body of this, the body of that. And so this whole teaching of Paul's right here in this passage is talking about what will happen with our human body. Our body will be changed instantly. It will be glorified in an instant to be like Jesus' glorified body. Hallelujah! What a wonderful moment this will be when we're finally rid of this human body. Especially we old people who are getting tired of the one we have. Now, why won't the soul be changed? You may remember that we've talked about the crucifying of the soul life, the need for the soul life to die. Well, 
Here is the story. Every life has its own nature. The dog has the dog nature. The cat has a cat nature. The apple tree has the apple tree nature. And fallen man has the Adamic sinful nature. Now please pay careful attention to this. This nature cannot be changed. That's right. It can never, ever be changed. There's no way to change the nature of a life. You can't make an apple tree into a banana tree. You can't make the sinful life into a holy life. There is no way to change it. That's why Jesus provided us with a way to die and a new life to be resurrected within us. He provided us with crucifixion and he provided us with resurrection and a new life from God which replaces our old life. There is no way to fix the old life. There's no changing it. You cannot change it. You can only replace it. And you replace it with something holy which comes from God. So many, many Christians are passing their time thinking, well, okay, I'm not really holy. I know I sin. I'm not that good. I realize my faults. But everyone's got them. They're all the same. The whole church is full of people just like I am. They swear accidentally. They lust accidentally. They uh, covet things without meaning to. They lie occasionally. That's just the way it is. Just accept it. Because our hope is in this future magic wand of Jesus, which he taps us on the head, or maybe in some cases whacks us on the head, and suddenly we'll be different than we are. Well, this is a lie. This is not true. There is no magic that can change what we are. There is no special potion or magic wand that can change the nature of a life. It is what it is, and it's always going to be that way. Jesus, by his mercy and grace, has provided an escape from our sinful condition. This escape is through his cross, as we've talked about before. I'm just repeating a little bit here. Please bear with me. We can actually experience a death to our own life, our suke life, our self life, our soul life, and have it replaced by God's life, which has his holy nature. Let me read a few verses here in the Gospels, which talks about the soul life, the suke life. We read in Matthew 10, 39, he who seeks out and lives by his soul life will have it utterly destroyed. But he who declares that his soul life must be put to death for my sake will be finding himself. Luke 9.24 For whosoever wishes to preserve his soul life will have it utterly destroyed. But whoever will agree that his soul life must be put to death for my sake, that one will be being saved. All right. In many Bible translations, we read, he who saves his soul life will lose it, or he who saves his soul will lose it, or even he who saves his life, which is even more vague. Well, losing it doesn't sound too bad, because who knows, you go around the next corner, maybe you find it. You lost it for a while, but, wow, you can get it back, and away you go. But the Greek word there means to have it utterly destroyed. The destination, the destiny of our soul life is to have it destroyed. Why is that? Because it is inherently, incurably sinful. 
And so God has a wonderful plan for your life. He loves you. And he has a wonderful plan for your life to get rid of it, to rid the universe of it. And this is, has two ways it can happen. We can submit to the operation of the cross through the Holy Spirit today, or we can have it destroyed tomorrow when Jesus comes. How is this life going to be destroyed tomorrow? Well, let's read a verse here. This is 1 Corinthians 3.15. I guess I don't have it written down. I'm just going to quote it. If any man's work, any man's works are burned up, he will suffer loss. We're reading about our works being tried by fire. Whether they be good or bad, the fire of God will test our works to see what they're made out of, to see what the substance is. But if any man's works are burned up, it says, he himself will be saved. Okay, wow, that's pretty cool. Even though my works are burned, I'm, I'm making it. But read the end of the verse. Yet, so as through the fire. Oh, not only our works are going to be analyzed, and tested by the fire of God. But we also are going to be analyzed and tested by the fire of God. Now I'm talking about Christians here. I'm not, not talking about unbelievers. Their works are not going to be, well, their works are going to be burned up. But we're talking about believers here. Our works will be tried by fire. And we too, according to this verse in Corinthians, we also will pass through the fire. What fire is that? Christians passing through the fire? Wait a minute. I thought that was for unbelievers. I thought that was for people going to hell. What do you mean, David, that Christians are going to pass through the fire? Well, what I mean is this. We are going to stand before God, who is a consuming fire. That's who he is. And that's what he is. And we're going to stand before him someday. Now God is holy. He is supremely holy. He's not a little holy, kind of holy, sort of righteous. He is intensely holy. He's extremely holy. He is so holy that anything unholy would feel as if it were on fire standing in front of him. People would feel as if they were burning up. We're not talking about a physical fire here. We're talking about the presence of God which is, in, which is compared to a consuming fire. And what is this fire consuming? Anything and everything that is not like him. Anything and everything which is not like him. Nothing which is unholy, which is selfish, which is self-centered. It's just anything which is unrighteous will not make it through that fire. It will be consumed. And that includes anything in you or me that does not get transformed in this life. That's right. If we don't yield ourselves to Jesus, and allow his cross to put to death who and what we are today, if we hang on to our soul life, we will have it utterly destroyed. We will lose it. And I'm explaining to you how it's going to be destroyed. 
it's going to be destroyed in the presence of God and by the presence of God, who is a consuming fire. Now, I realize this may be new to you, but it is very true and very important. This old man, this old nature, this old life is not going to enter in to the new creation. Something has to happen to it. When we stand before God, the opportunity for death and resurrection or transformation, I hope you watch the video on forgiveness and transformation if you don't understand this process. This process of transformation, which is death and resurrection, is over. It stopped. There's no way before the throne of God to start suddenly dying and resurrecting and getting transformed. That time's over. That period of time has passed. The Bible says very clearly, today is the day of salvation. Today is the day to seek the Lord, to be free from who and what we are. Because when he comes and we stand before him, the intensity of who he is will test what we are. And anything and everything that is not equal to him will be burned up. There's no other, there's no other way it could get through. It's not asbestos. It's not going to make it. The fiery presence of God, the intensity of who he is, will test us. Whatever is of his life and his nature will be happy there. We'll pass that test easily because it's what he is. In fact, it's from him. It's his gift to us. It's what we what he has done in our lives. Obviously, this will pass the test. But there are some parts of us, perhaps more than we would wish, which have not been or will not have been transformed. Don't set your hope on this vague idea of being suddenly changed to be like him and escape this fiery test. That is not going to work. We've already explained that. That verse is talking about the body, which will be instantly changed. And there is no mechanism, none that is shown to us in the Bible for any instant change of our nature, of the unholy, sinful nature. There is no such thing as instantaneous change of our nature. The only thing that remains to us if we continue to be unholy and sinful when we show up in the presence of God is suffering loss, having our soul life destroyed as Jesus himself taught us. This is quoted five times in the Gospels, twice in Matthew and once in each of the other Gospels. Jesus himself tells us, if you hang on to that soul life, if you love it, if you keep it, if you don't crucify it, it will be utterly destroyed. Utterly. It's gone. Well, wait a minute. What, <laughs> what's that going to look like? Uh, we lose part of our soul life. What, what's that mean? Are there going to be Christians there without arms or legs? or What? What's that mean? Well, I believe that it means that this spiritual growth, the maturity we attain in this life, will be our eternal condition. For example, today there are babes in Christ, there are young men, there are old men, there are all kinds of stages of spiritual growth which the New Testament mentions quite clearly. Paul talks about carnal Christians, baby Christians. John talks about young men who've overcome the evil one. He talks about the fathers. These are all 
stages of spiritual growth. And so where we arrive in this life before Jesus comes or before we die will be our eternal condition. If we never grew up, if we remained a baby, then all the rest will be lost and we'll, we will have what we have gained. I believe that this eternal life of God is eternal. It's not granting our life to go on. In fact, as we're seeing, that's not going to happen ever. Knowing God, not knowing God, our old life is destined to be destroyed. It's already under judgment. But this new eternal life that we receive from Jesus and all the growth of life, all the maturity that we attain in this life is eternal. It's permanent. It's something that God has done. And what God does lasts. However, this loss of our soul life is something very serious. What will a man give in exchange for his soul? What do you have besides who you are? If you hang on to it, if you don't want to suffer, if you don't want to die, if you just want the good things, then you will have it destroyed. Now I'm going to tell you an important truth. Please pay attention. In eternity, there are not piles of gold and gemstones and mansions and big cars to drive around in. I know the street of the New Jerusalem is paved with gold. That's a singular word, by the way. There aren't streets. There's only one street, which means there's only one way. And no one will have cars because imagine everyone parking on the same street. It would be pretty crowded. And also, as long as we're at it, there aren't mansions. It's funny because only the King James Bible, as far as I know, uses the word mansions. In my father's house, Jesus says, there are many mansions. Only the King James Bible. But wherever you go, all over the world, Christians are hoping for mansions. Well, the Greek word there is living place, a dwelling, not a mansion. And Paul explains this in 2 Corinthians, I believe. I'll put up the verse on the screen. He's talking about his body. And he says, I don't want to be, we, we who are in this body groan. Not that we want to be unclothed, but clothed upon with our habitation that is from heaven. This habitation, the heavenly habitation, which we will get, is the new body. There are no mansions. You won't need one, and you won't want one. You won't need to cook any food, so there are no kitchens. You won't need to go to the bathroom, so you don't need one of those. There's no night, so you won't need a bedroom to sleep. There's no nothing hidden or dark, so you won't need to get away for a little while. There are no mansions in heaven. Sorry. There are only the new glorified bodies. So our reward is not mansions, it's not piles of gold. You wouldn't know what to do with gold there anyway, because there's nothing to buy. Who and what is our reward? God said to Abraham, I am your shield and your exceedingly great reward. There's only one reward. And it's the same for everybody. It's God himself. Don't be disappointed. There's no limit to God himself. It's not like this is a poor offering or this is a bad reward. There's nothing else to compare to it. God is infinite and eternal, but he is our reward. Now pay attention to this. Our spiritual maturity will give us the capacity to enjoy God 
to a greater or lesser extent. Our spiritual maturity will give us the ability to enjoy God more or less, which means our reward will be greater or lesser, even though it's the same for everyone. Now think about it. I have a grandson who's two and a half years old. He enjoys life a lot. He runs around and does all kinds of things. And, but because of his immaturity, his experience of life is limited. He can't travel by himself. He can't drive a car. He can't get married. He can't earn money. He can't buy stuff at the store. There are thousands of things he can't do. Now, he's a pretty happy fellow, and I'm glad for that. And he, by the way, doesn't realize, really, these limitations. They don't bother him. He just goes about his life, running around. He runs a lot, running around all over the place. And he's happy. He's a happy fellow. But he's missing out on a lot. And in the same way, our spiritual maturity will govern our capacity to enjoy God, more or less. Those who really gave themselves to him and were transformed are going to have an unlimited supply of God himself to enjoy and explore for eternity. You see, our reward depends on our spiritual growth. The reward is exactly the same for everyone. It is God himself. But even though it's the same, it won't be the same. Because some people, many, many people, are not growing. They're not changing. They're just content to wait until the last trumpet in the twinkling of an eye and hope that suddenly they are changed, which they won't be. And this is really sad. One reason I'm making this video is to warn you and to wake you up and to help you realize that today is the day of salvation. The Bible never says tomorrow is the day of salvation. Tomorrow is the day of judgment. What? Judgment? God's not going to judge us. He's already forgiven us. Well, yes, he will. God will judge his people. We today are in the age of grace, and God is not judging us. But every age in the past, every single age, ended. It ended. And the age of grace is going to end. When the bell sounds, well, it's not the bell, it's the trumpet. That means the age of grace has come to an end. And the age of judgment has come. And one of the first things that will happen is that we will all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. We, us, all of us, will appear and be judged for what we did with what he gave us. We will be judged. And we're not going to be judged only by words, but by who and what God is that will test us. I was sitting on a plane not too long ago by a guy who worked for one of the U.S. agencies, one of, the, one of these agencies that's recording everyone's telephone calls. And I said, oh, well, you know, that's interesting, but I know somebody way worse than that, than you guys recording all the phone calls. I know someone who's recording all of our thoughts. Who's that, he said. Who's that? He said, it's God. He's recording all our thoughts. It says the meditations of the, all the hearts will be exposed, will be revealed. God is going to press the play button on the heavenly recorder. We're there standing before God, let's say, and 
we feel convicted of some sin or other. Oh, no, no, it wasn't really like that. It was this, it was that, it wasn't my fault. And here goes the play button. And the universe will hear our excuses and our reasonings to try to excuse ourselves from our sinful behavior. It's all there. It's all recorded. In the last video, we were talking about the Ancient of Days sitting on the throne, and it says the court was seated and the books were opened. These books are, are full of all those things that are written. I was talking about a recorder, but the Bible says they're all written down. A permanent record of all our justifications and excuses for not being transformed when Jesus paid the ultimate price so that we could be. Okay, now let's try to quote a verse. The sinners in Zion are afraid. Fearfulness has seized the hypocrites. Who among us will dwell with the everlasting fire? And then it goes on to say, righteous people, holy people, People who have given their lives to God. Brothers and sisters, let me tell you, our God is a consuming fire. He's not going to put that fire out, douse himself with a bucket of water before we show up. He's not going to put a fire retardant shield between us and himself. We are going to stand before his throne without any protection, Oh, oh, but, but he'll forgive me. I've been forgiven. He, he won't judge me. He'll, he'll f just forgive me. Well, no, not in that day. You know, he's provided forgiveness, and we've talked about this in another video, to give us access to his transformation. But when we show up before him, forgiveness is no longer available. He's going to ask you, what did you do with the forgiveness which I gave you? Did you just take advantage of it? Did you receive grace of God in vain, which means without results? Did you just try to take advantage of the goodness of God and get by with not going through the experience of death and resurrection? Well, if you did, then I am here to tell you, you are going to suffer loss. You yourself will pass through the fire, and what is not like God will be burned up, irrecoverably lost, totally destroyed, without hope of recuperation, of getting any of it back. It'll be gone. In the book of Revelation, there is an interesting scene. There is something called a sea of glass mingled with fire. It turns out that this is the pavement immediately in front of God's throne. It's crystal clear, but it's burning. It's on fire. And the funny thing is, there, there are a bunch of people there, and there's fire. And they're singing. They've got harps, I believe. And they're worshiping God. There they are in this flame, this burning fire. It has no effect whatsoever on them. <laughs> they're fireproof because they have become what God is. Do you remember the three friends of Daniel that were thrown into the fiery furnace? They got that furnace so hot that even the men who threw them in were killed by the flame. But yet there they were, these three young men, right in the middle of this burning flame, and it didn't touch them. Nothing happened. Their clothes didn't burn. When they came out, they didn't even smell like smoke. This is what God wants for us. We need to let God's fiery presence cleanse us today so that tomorrow the fire will have no effect on us. This is really important, brothers and sisters. This is what we need to do. Jesus said 
that we will be baptized with the Holy Spirit and with fire. And this fire is the intense presence of God, which will come upon us when we're open and ready for it, and will lovingly expose us and burn away the dross that's in our lives and change us to be like him. So let's get on with it now. Let's be part of that group that's standing in the presence of God, in that burning crystal sea, worshiping and rejoicing in what God has done in us and for us. And let's not be those who resist God and draw back. Paul said, we're not among those. Don't be among those that draw back to destruction. But those who have faith to the complete saving of the soul. Amen.